uh, Ephesians very clearly points out that we're going to be engaged in battle. It very, very uh, succinctly explains what some of the battles are going to consist of, who the battles are going to be with and against. And so, so to not realize as a believer that you're not going to be confronted and caught up in what we call spiritual warfare is, 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 is crazy thinking. Now, now, don't fear it. Understand that you overcome battles with the right weapons, tools. And the main weapon that we have today is, of course, the Word of God. And, and I like this scripture uh, because it says in verse 10, the Lord your God has multiplied you. I mean, a walk of faith begun with Abraham, you know, wh what he was to leave, where he was to go, and what you, the key ingredient, you know, we call him the father of faith, but the thing that I see most prevalent in Abraham's life is obedience. He obeyed. It wasn't easy sometimes for him to obey, but he obeyed. And so obedience is the key to victory in life. In other words, how do we gain the fullness of power to fight the battles that we're going to be called on to fight? Well, the first thing we learn, if we want to succeed, we've got to learn to die to self. Dying to self is one of the strong elements of victory, of overcoming, of leadership, of power and authority. So the Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. It's, a, it's an amazing fact about the nation of Israel. Ever since Israel came into existence, the aim of the devil is to inflict them with what we call genocide. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Hitler, Hitler almost did that to the European Jew when he killed and cremated six million of them. But all the, many of the nations of Europe engaged willingly in their attack upon the Jewish people. There, there's a, on, on the History Channel right now, there's Nazi death squads. Many of these European nations willingly engaged in killing the Jews in their own nation. The, the, the aim of the Palestinian Authority is to eradicate the nation of Israel, to wipe them off the face of the earth. So, so from the very beginning of time, Satan's aim was to eradicate, eradicate through genocide the nation of Israel. Why? Because they're the chosen people of God. People ask me all the time, why do the Jews have a right to Palestine? They have a divine right. God gave them a divine right. This is yours. He told Abraham, wherever you walk, wherever the soles of your feet touch, I'll give that to you. And so, so they, they kind of leave that point out. They have a right to be a state, a nation, whatever you want to call them, by divine right. And then in verse 11, listen to this. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times, you know, Jesse Duplantis and Copeland, they'll say, uh, the, they preach on the hundredfold blessing. I believe, like John believes, this is a thousandfold blessing. Make you a thousand times more numerous than you are. What, what does that tell me? It tells me that Satan is never going to eradicate the nation of Israel. Because this, this is a promise of God. Make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. You know, you know I, I say this all the time, constantly. The, the first thing I would seek after becoming saved 
God, you've chosen me now. What is my mission? What is my vision? What is my promise? Too many Christians are just fumbling through life, kind of kind of almost walking with a blind man's cane, hoping that they're going to get from point A to point B. The whole purpose of prayer is so that God can speak to you what your mission, purpose, and vision is, and then help you to achieve and fulfill that mission, purpose, and vision. The, the Bible very clearly says without a vision, the people perish. There's, there's no hope for a man without a vision. He's he just waiting to die. He's just setting, rocking his way, waiting for the church to be caught away. Now, now I want you to turn over to the same uh, book, but over to Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter. So, so how to gain the fullness of power that's promised to us. One of the first ways, and, and we will be doing this this coming Saturday, and it's open to everybody, it's open to all churches, it's open to all the saints of God. And what we do there, we do it every Saturday, but especially on the first Saturday, we're hoping our own church will be more active in that activity is that we intercede for the saints. And sometimes you have to die to self to intercede for the saints. You know, we've, Sharni and I have experienced, had two experiences in our 50 years of ministry being treated magnificently and being treated abominably. You get, bo you, you, you get both of that in church life. I, I've sh tried to share with you, I'm, I don't know, I, I'm almost reluctant to hear some well-meaning saint jump up on a Sunday morning, run down by me on, or by both of us, put his arm around him and say, I'm, I'm a mighty, mighty man of God, and I'm a mighty, mighty man for Pastor Gary and Pastor Charlene. And two weeks later, the mighty man of God, our woman, is gone. So, so I would just rather people, as Jack Nicholson said, would just pick up a gun and stand on the wall <laughs> as, as to infer... And so, so be, be faithful to God. We're talking about intercession. In Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be be uttered. Have you ever wondered, and, and I don't want this to be a put down of any other denomination. That's not what I'm preaching here today. But I am, I am saying this, and you might be surprised when you walked in here today. We are Pentecostal. And that means we involve the Holy Spirit in everything we can involve the Spirit in Every aspect, he, he is welcome in this church. And one of the things in the 50 years, and it doesn't matter if they stayed or if they left, when there was real disaster that entered their life, guess who they called? The Pentecostal church that they no longer seem to find favor in. Why? Why would that happen? Why, why would you leave a fellowship that is Pentecostal only to seek much-needed prayer from the same fellowship that you left? Well, we're going to find out today. 
Notice, notice my second point. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. What, why would you not seek a church who functions in the power of the Holy Spirit and all of its anointing when you have something that would fit into dire straits and you need prayer for it? But what? Why You wouldn't go to someone who said, I don't know a thing about finances, but you're worse than me, so come to me. You'd say, no, you'd have to be crazy to do that. Yeah, you would. I, I don't know if you remember, remember this sister or not. She may be watching us today. I don't know if Charlene gave her our, our little web page or what. But her name was Karen Kuhn. She worked for Delta uh, Airplane. Airplane fly, fly. I don't know. She did she book or what? Was she a booker or worked worked in the airport or whatever? Charlene linked up with her this week. She now lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And Charlene will be able to maintain contact with her. She says to this day she still remembers Calvary Assembly of God. Still remembers Janice. So how, how, and it's probably been 20, 25 years since she left. He searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Who would want anything other than the will of God for their life? Now, there's no doubt about it, Satan, the enemy of our soul, is mighty. He's got power. He's over the kingdoms of this world. But the thing we must never forget is that he's not mightier than a sanctified, spirit-filled saint of God. So if you needed prayer, wouldn't you seek out a sanctified, spirit-filled saint of God? I would. That would make Common sense to me. So the conflict is not against flesh and blood, but against demonic spirit power. We need victory over demonic spirit power. So, what is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Or the Holy Ghost, as, as he's also referred to. It's the secret power of service. How can you serve if you have no spiritual power? I'm not going to get into denominations, but I I have went to school with in denominations that said to fill, be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues is of the devil. Why would I go there for prayer? On the contrary, man, I'd get my tail out of there as quick as I could. In Acts 1.8, this is what it says, Jesus is speaking. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I know there are many powerful spirit-filled Christians in this church. And that's what we need when we need healing. Our wisdom. Even wisdom to buy a car or a house or a bicycle or whatever. I put it, my second point, I put the tragedy of being powerless in the face of the enemy. I can't imagine how we would have made it through if I didn't have this church to say, Charlene has been diagnosed with this. Let's go to prayer. Let's pray. I, I was sitting here today, I, I was looking at this message, and I thought, how many things have I experienced? We had a blind man in this church. 
but they took a tumor out of his brain and he couldn't see very well. His church prayed for him and on the way home he was reading signs that he hadn't read for years posted along the highway. I've told you this story until it's almost embarrassing, but a man came down here who could only speak Spanish. And I prayed for him along with you. It wasn't just my prayers, it was your prayer. And I don't know why, but I put my hand over his ears. Just felt like I needed to do that. Then all of a sudden he began to yell and holler and scream and run and roll. And I mean, I, I, I'm so insignificant in the healing process of prayer, I, I couldn't, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I had to ask somebody who's fluent in Spanish, what's wrong with this guy? And they said, he just got hearing. He just, God just healed him. And, I, and I've thought back over the years of all the people that experience absolutely miraculous things in their lives. So when the Holy Ghost takes possession, something changes. That's why people call back. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what he's done for all of you folks out there. The Holy Spirit has conformed you to the image of Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus did, you can do. that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, but we're going to be the secondborn. We're predestined for that. Predestined for what, Pastor Gary? Authority over the enemy. You don't have to accept, you don't have to say, I was born in the wrong time, I was born in the wrong family, in the wrong area. No, you weren't. That's to say God is foolish and he does nothing but make ac cause accidents. God doesn't do that. You're predestined for authority over the enemy. And in Romans 8.30 it says, Moreover whom he predestines, these he also called. You're called today. To sit around and bemoan, well, oh woe is me. The only problem is you're not letting the Holy Spirit speak to you about who you are in Jesus, what he's called you to and for. And whom he called, it says that these he also justified. That used to, we would say, just as if they never sinned. That's what justification means. Justification means that those that were guilty got off by the sacrifice of one who was not guilty at all. That's what Jesus did for you. We were, we're all guilty. We, we, we deserve hell. But we escaped it through the act of justification. Jesus wiped our sins away and made us just as if we'd never sinned. But those he justified, he also glorified. What does that mean? You are truly destined for the throne. What does that mean to be destined for the throne? It means that you're going to be raised up with Christ. You're, you're never going to die. The minute you, minute the undertaker said, or a doctor said they're dead, he was wrong. You're Unfortunately, even those that go to hell never die. Nobody ever dies. But some are going to spend eternity in heaven and some will spend eternity in hell. You need to know that you're going to be raised up with Christ. That implies power. Power in Jesus demands sacrifice. So what does the Holy Spirit really do? He comes and lives in people like you and me. He wants to indwell you. 
empower you. But it demands that we give him full possession of our bodies. We did that to Satan. At one time, Satan had full control of our minds and our bodies, emotions, spirits. See, most people do not experience the level of power that is promised to us in and through Jesus Christ. Why? Because they deny the Holy Spirit. They relegate the Holy Spirit to dispensationalism. Oh, well, that, that was for the first century church. It was for every church. The first thing you learn in the book of Revelations is that seven letters to the seven churches are sent to representatives of every church in every age since there's been a church. It, is a, it wasn't just the writing of the book of Revelation. You can find every one of those churches somewhere in the world today. One, one church had left its first love. Church, there are churches today. Well, we, we don't allow that. The Laodicean church was a completely backslidden church. You can, you can find every church in the book of Revelation in the, somewhere in the world. The only, the, really, the only two churches that received any kind of true accommodation from Jesus was Smyrna, the suffering church. They suffered mightily. But they even, Jesus even said, but I have this against you. The true church is the Philadelphia church. And that's the church that's going to be caught away. The church that he's coming for that we hear all the time. That church without spot or wrinkle. Would well, you know what that church is? It's the Philadelphia church. The church that Jesus had no criticisms of. And you know, uh, People say this to me all the time. There, there's no such word as rapture in the Bible. No, there isn't. They don't, they don't talk about it. That's a Latin word. But there's the parousa in Greek means catching away. And after the fourth letter to the churches, you don't read about the churches until almost the last chapters of the book of Revelation. And John, John what does Jesus say? Come up here to, through this open door. He's looking at the events, the great tribulation, through heavenly eyes. And if there's no catching away, how does the second return of Jesus Christ, how does he come with his saints? Have you ever stopped to think about that? He comes, he comes back the second time, puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, and takes care of Satan through the battle of Armageddon, but he, but he returns with his saints. If there's no rapture, how did they get out of here? How did they get up into heaven with him? See, see, we make it too complicated. And if there's understanding in Scripture, go with the understanding of Scripture. Don't, don't, don't make it more complicated than, than we have to. Holy Ghost is a person, third part of the Trinity. Now, now you, I ask a question. I said, why would anybody call Pentecostal churches for prayer? Because the Holy Spirit has intelligence. He has love. He has a will of his own. He won't lie to you. When, when we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, that's how we end up buying the wrong house. That's how we end up buying the wrong car. And I, I hate to mention this, but at the rate of divorce in America today, that's why we end up marrying the wrong person. The Bible very clearly says, do not become unequally yoked. The divorce rate in churches today is as high if not a little higher than the world. What does that tell me? It tells me somebody didn't listen. 
and became unequally yoked. The Savior lived in a human tabernacle. The Holy Ghost dwells in human tabernacles. Being filled with the Holy Ghost. Steve Davis was telling me, I think it was two weeks ago, he preached uh, at a church. They had 3,000 people and he was preaching on the prophetic. And he'll be doing that here in the very near future. And he took the time to say, does anybody want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? And about 30% of those people raised their hands and said, yes, we do. That's a smart church. I I remember, uh, this was many, many years ago, it was a church in Texas, a Baptist church of 10,000. Pastor met some Holy Ghost filled people and he said, you know what, I want what you got. So he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He went to a very smart board, understanding board, and he told him, he says, you know, I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. You know how we Baptists feel about that. And they said, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for us. And they all got filled with the Holy Ghost. And long story short, that 10,000 member Baptist church became a Pentecostal Baptist. That tells me all I need to know. That was a smart bunch of Baptists. <laughs> so just as you presented and I presented our members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, So now we need to present our members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Two people with different wills cannot live in the same temple. If we are to walk in the promises and power, we've got to be willing to die to self. Romans 12, 1, we read it, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is in your reasonable service. We think that's a big deal. The Bible says that's reasonable. The Spirit is saying, If I come in, I'm coming in as God. Self must get out. Self must die. You must nail it to the cross. The Holy Spirit really is saying, I won't mix myself with yourself. The Holy Ghost doesn't share your life. He wants your life. Your fallen nature, all of it, must be nailed to the cross. We used to sing an old song, I Surrender All. What's the sign of surrender? Raised hand. That's why we raised our hands. I surrender, God. I give up. I can't do it. Otherwise, if we don't surrender, we're going to screw up daily. Hourly. 